During the climactic scene of the 2016 movie Arrival, Louise experiences more than 20, well, let's call them temporal viewings. The revelations in the final sequence of the film are enlightening, but they raise as many questions as they answer, some technical and some of a more existential and philosophical nature. Do the events we see unfold cause a paradox? Did Louise make the right choice? Did she even have a choice? And in the end, what does all of it mean? Hello everyone, I'm Sendaria. If you enjoy the deep exploration of themes, symbolism, and hidden meanings in films like this one, then I invite you to please like this video. It helps YouTube know to offer it to other like-minded folks. In this video, we will explore the plot and major themes of Arrival, and see if we can untangle the narrative web that this film weaves. But even more importantly, we'll discover if we, much like Louise with the heptapods, can decipher the messages it contains. Arrival was written by screenwriter Eric Heiserer and directed by Denis Villeneuve. It is based on the Nebula-winning 1998 science fiction novella Story of Your Life by Ted Chiang. If you haven't seen the film, I can't recommend it highly enough. Please, please stop watching this video right now, go and see Arrival, and then come back. It's a film that really should be experienced unspoiled, and I'm about to go full spoiler. So with that warning out of the way, let's dive in. Arrival weaves the themes of communication and altered perception almost seamlessly into ideas that challenge the audience's own perception of time, choice, and meaning. It uses the visual medium of film to extraordinary effect to help convey these themes and ideas. By the end of the film, the audience is left feeling much like Louise, wondering if their own perceptions have been changed, and if so, how. It's a film that encourages repeat viewings and a much, much closer look. Let's touch on some of the main plot points and themes through the movie, just to sort of refresh our memories, and after that we'll do a scene-by-scene -scene breakdown, and also I'll reveal the important messages this film conveys. Essentially, the film deals with the arrival of 12 alien ships, spread out at various points around the globe, and humanity's attempts to communicate with the aliens, which we call heptapods, due to their seven limbs. Hepta is Greek for seven, and pod for foot. Why do the heptapods have seven limbs? This makes them heptaradially symmetrical. Say that five times fast. In essence, they have no front or back. Every side of them is the same as every other side, like a starfish or a sea anemone, but with seven limbs. The main character, linguistic professor Dr. Louise Banks, has a breakthrough with the heptapods' written language and really immerses herself in it as she works towards being able to clearly ask them what their purpose is on Earth. The result of that prolonged language immersion is mind-bending, time-shattering alterations in her perception of reality. The heptapods experience time in a non-linear fashion, which essentially means they don't differentiate between the future and the past and are equally aware of both. This is reflected in their written language, which they create in this circular form. It reads the same backwards as forwards, and it doesn't contain tenses. The words can be placed in any order. This type of writing is called non-linear orthography. The circular images themselves are called logograms, which is a symbol that represents a phrase or idea. An example of a logogram that you probably use every day is an emoji. Human languages that use logograms include Mandarin and Egyptian hieroglyphs. Once the perceptual shift in time is experienced by Louise, well, everything changes, and we'll explore what it means for her and for humanity near the end of the video. One of the main themes explored in this film is how even slight distortions in perception can cause miscommunication, including among people speaking the same language. This makes learning the language of a foreign culture particularly difficult, and the language of a truly alien culture orders of magnitude more so. Without a truly common frame of reference, miscommunications happen constantly. We can see examples of this theme throughout the film, including governments withholding information, leading to widespread panic, the average soldiers know almost as little as the average civilian, which leads to an armed conflict later in the movie, because it leaves this massive knowledge gap into which predatory purveyors of misinformation can pour their poison. A related idea that's crucial to the plot is that learning a new language, truly immersing oneself in that language, can rewire the brain, changing the way a person thinks. This is a real scientific hypothesis called the Saber-Whorf Hypothesis. Being sci-fi, the movie takes this hypothesis and really runs with it. 
That's what's happening to Louise throughout the film. She's having experiences that she can't explain. The climax of the film is the reveal that as she immersed herself more and more completely in the heptapod language, she had begun to experience nonlinear time, as the heptapods do, where there are no beginnings and no endings, not the way we think of them, we who experience linear time. The concept of circular time is portrayed everywhere in this film. It's visually present in things like this curved corridor in the hospital, Louise's earrings, and the circular building that the United Nations reception is being held in. It's thematically present in the repeating structure of the film itself. The first shot, this pan down from the ceiling of Louise's home, is the same as the shot near the end of the film. Her first words to her daughter are the same as the last words to her daughter. And of course, her daughter Hannah's name being a palindrome, reading the same forwards as backwards. Even the sound design and music makes use of this concept, as the main score frequently uses the circle of fifths, which is a series of perfect fifths played together in a fashion where they are the same forwards as backwards. The film uses the visual medium to maximum effect. Everything the audience sees, from the sweeping shots of the giant ships to the intimate close-ups of the characters, are meaningful, conveying so much information to the audience without a word spoken. It's brilliantly meta as it parallels the plot, and it's one of the reasons the film at the end feels more like an unfolding revelation and not a typical gotcha twist. It feels very organic. So now that we've refreshed our memory and know some of what we're looking for, let's do a scene by scene breakdown. And at the end, we'll come back and take a look at all of these pieces to see if we can't figure out what it means. The film begins with a pan down from the ceiling of Louise's home. In addition to tying the beginning and end of the film together, Director Denis Villeneuve has stated that this shot is supposed to reference the later shots inside the heptapod ship with the barrier. The trees are even meant to be reminiscent of the heptapods. Now we see what appears to be a flashback, the birth, life, and death of a child with a short narration concerning time and memory. Louise says that once she thought that birth was the beginning of her daughter's story and death the ending. She then tells us she's no longer sure she believes in beginnings and endings. Immediately, we're introduced to Louise's changing perceptions of reality, but there isn't any context yet for the audience concerning why she's experiencing this. I did want to point out this very odd but intentional close-up on the gold wedding ring the first time she holds her newborn daughter. This is a clue to the later time reveal in two ways. First, literally, as she does not have this wedding band when we see her just a few minutes later, which hints that this is not the past or the present. And second, Symbolically, as the band represents the eternal and circular nature of time. The montage with the child growing up shows one scene where she is playing with the horse costume, and the multiple legs are meant to be another reference to the heptapods. When Louise is touching her daughter's hair, you see her jewelry is also circular. And after leaving her child's bedside in the hospital, Louise walks this circular corridor. We then see Louise as she arrives to teach a college class in linguistics. She passes a group of students outside the classroom watching something on TV. She doesn't stop to investigate. The tension is low but immediate as she notices that her class is mostly empty and only a moment later is interrupted by the students' cell phones and devices. One of the students asks her to turn on a news channel and we hear a news broadcaster speaking about the arrival of 12 alien craft. Why 12 ships? It does make sense symbolically. Humans use base 10 for most math, but one area that humans do not use base 10 is for measuring time. For that, we use base 60 and base 12. 12 months in a year, 12 hours for a day, 12 hours for a night. In addition, in mythology going back to ancient Greece, 12 represents perfection or a cosmic whole. There are 12 principal Olympic gods and 12 titans before them, the 12 labors of Hercules, Biblically, Isaac and Abraham both have 12 sons, Jesus has 12 disciples, it could go on, but you see the symbolism of wholeness, the gods, and cosmic forces. When Louise gets home later that evening, we see her framed in the same glass wall as the opening shot, right in the middle, between these two trees, a visual link from past to present to future events. Two days later, Louise receives a visit from U.S. Army Colonel Weber, who requests she translate an audio file of the alien language. 
She makes it very clear that she would need to be there in person in order to have a chance at the translation, and he rebuffs her. There's another linguist at Stanford he plans to visit. She stops Weber on his way out and tells him that before committing to the linguist at Stanford to ask him how he translates the Sanskrit word for war. Early the next morning, the colonel shows up on her doorstep, having arrived by helicopter, and says that the other linguist says it means an argument, and asks her what she says it means. She replies, A desire for more cows. Thank you, Biggs. Her understanding of the fine distinctions of this translation is important. It shows the colonel and the audience that Louise has a deep grasp of the nuance of language and how small shifts in meaning can cause large misunderstandings. She's asked to join the team of scientists who are studying the craft and the beings that have landed in Montana. As the helicopter flies away, we get this really interesting shot from inside her home. By the end of the film, I think we can look back and see more meaning in this shot. In the helicopter, she meets a physicist, Ian Donnelly. He's trying to speak with her, but she doesn't have her headphones on yet, so she can't understand him. Once she puts them on, he shows her that he's reading a book she wrote, and he quotes her introductory passage, Language is the foundation of civilization. He says she's wrong, and that the cornerstone of civilization isn't language, it's science. Considering they're using technology to communicate here, I think the message is that language is foundational. But technology can help facilitate it. Cooperation is key. It also shows how who and what we are shapes our perceptions. Ian is a theoretical physicist, so to him, science is the most important tool, and he comes at every problem from the angle of a physicist. He wants to try and open communications with the heptapods by showing them binary sequences. Louise says they should just try talking to them before they start throwing math problems at them. Apparently, the ships were originally conceived as spheres, but it felt too intrusive visually, and Denis worked with the production designer to come up with this oblong shape modeled on an asteroid. Even the texture of the ship is rough like stone, not smooth like typical alien ships in other movies. The director added this concave lens shape like an eye. The scientists in the main communication room are on a conference call with Australia, and they're discussing the fact that the aliens basically kick the humans out of the ship after a very specific length of time. It seems they need time between sessions to replenish the atmosphere and correct the pressure to be safe for the human visitors. The scientists even state outright that they believe this is for the benefit of the humans. But this guy, Agent Helpern's takeaway from the conversation? So you're saying they can suffocate us. Just as in the helicopter with Ian, we're seeing how the preconceptions we have shape our perceptions. Agent Halpern sees everything from the angle of a possible threat through the lens of fear. Even though there's no trace of radiation from the alien vessel, everyone is required to wear hazmat suits, so Louise and Ian get suited up and head out for their first meeting. The ship hovers a little off the ground. After having traveled all the way here, it's asking the humans to take the final step in the journey to reach them. This entire sequence is fascinating. After the bottom of the ship opens, we get disorienting shots from different angles, as well as these distorted reflections in the face guards as the crew ascends into the shaft that leads up into the ship. There's a brief demonstration made with a glow stick that gravity will shift a few feet up the shaft from where the lift stops. They go up a few more feet and stop at a point where they become weightless, which is already going to be difficult to adjust to for someone who hasn't experienced it before. The experienced crew members, the ones who have already done this a few times, jump off the platform and reorient themselves so that what was the wall of the shaft becomes the floor. What was up is now forward. This shot shows that Louise is struggling to understand how to orient herself in relation to the crew. Are they standing on a wall? On a ceiling? The colonel grabs Louise and helps her when she seems a little mentally stuck here and not sure how to proceed. Once she lands in the new gravity, she looks outside, which was down, but is now behind. And we see that Ian makes the jump alone and falls down. I think this may foreshadow how he struggles to accept the implications of nonlinear time at the end of the movie, while Louise, with assistance, is able to embrace it. As Ian and Louise enter the chamber for the first time, we get another shot of them upside down, showing how the disorientation persists. This scene is really brilliantly done because it forces the audience and the characters into a new way of thinking before they even encounter the heptapods themselves, and it continues to develop the ongoing theme of transformed perception. Now we get a first-person view from inside Louise's helmet, and we can see that the protective face gear and the hazmat suit are distorting her vision. We, the audience, see a clear white rectangle, but all of the humans in this chamber are viewing everything through layers of protective gear. 
They set up their safety equipment, which includes an actual canary to help them determine the breathability of the atmosphere, even though they're using hazmat suits and breathers to be safe. We get our first view of the aliens, obscured by vapor clouds on their side of the barrier, and we don't get to see much of Louise's first contact. Instead, it cuts back to everyone at base camp. There's an interesting transition shot where we see a computer screen distorted as it is reflected onto a plastic barrier. More visual imagery about distorted perceptions when there are barriers in place. Louise is listening to the recording of the heptapods communicating with each other verbally and realizes it's far too alien a sound and she won't be able to speak it back to them. Meanwhile, we see that fear is filling the gaps in the absence of solid information from authorities and is leading to looting, rioting, and also a religious cult has taken the Heaven's Gate route as they saw the event as a sign of the end times. As Louise is getting ready to go back into the ship, she's sitting half in, half out of her hazmat suit, her hands shaking, and she looks up and notices a whiteboard that's being used to keep track of the air tanks. Thinking on her feet, she decides to take it with her to use as a visual aid. As she explains to the colonel, she's hoping that they might have a written language or some form of visual communication. Inside the ship, she writes the word human and shows it to the heptapods. We're again shown her point of view from inside the hazmat suit, and we see how distorted her vision is, but she persists with her word, both showing it and saying it, human. The heptapods respond, each creating a circular logogram. Louise has succeeded in communicating, the first to have done so of the 12 teams. Back at base camp, the colonel expresses doubt that teaching them to speak and read at the same time is a good idea. He thinks it will be too slow. Louise simply tells him, You're wrong. It's faster. Which we actually know to be true. Full immersion, reading, writing, and speaking is the fastest way to learn a language. We get an interesting conversation between Ian and a scientist on a team in the UK. They have been trying to use mathematics to communicate, and although their heptapods have responded, they don't really know what to make of it. They don't seem to understand algebra, but they do respond to more complex math. There is communication happening using science and math as a language, but it is not effective communication. Colonel Weber starts questioning the vocabulary words that Louise intends to introduce in the next session with the heptapods, which includes her and Ian's names, as well as what the colonel describes as grade school words. He's clearly frustrated as he wants the communication to move a lot faster. In order to explain, Louise goes to a large whiteboard that's covered in complex math and starts to erase a bit in the middle where she can write the question that they ultimately wish to ask the heptapods. What is your purpose on Earth? It seems like a very simple question, but she explains that there are a lot of assumptions that we as humans make when we see this seemingly simple inquiry. Assumptions that cannot be made when learning to communicate with the heptapods. Do they understand what a question is? Can they understand that your refers to a collective you, the heptapods, not an individual you, or Joe Alien as she calls it? What's fascinating here is this great framing, how the sentence they're working towards asking is surrounded by this nearly incomprehensible math, visually demonstrating that language is not just the foundation, but the heart of civilization. With her very advanced scientific communication tools of pen and whiteboard, Louise and Ian go back into the ship. She writes her name and shows it to the heptapods. They appear to respond with their symbol for humans again. She is struggling with how to get this idea across the one mentioned earlier, a collective term like human versus an individual and their name. And once more we see from Louise's point of view from inside the helmet with those same visual distortions. There are too many barriers between them for effective communication. Louise looks over at the chirping canary, deliberates for a moment, and then begins removing her hazmat suit. She approaches the heptapod, still carrying her whiteboard. And now we get this beautifully framed shot, a mirror to the scene near the beginning of the film. The lighting here is also bright, the colors crisp, and the shot focused. For the first time, she's starting to see things clearly, and we get our first close-up of the heptapods. I'm going to go out on one tiny limb here. I don't know for a fact that this was intentional in the creature design, but to me, these features here on what you might call a knuckle look like closed eyes. There is an idea in both Eastern and Western mysticism that you must close your physical eyes in order to be able to open your third eye, the hidden inner eye, which is associated with clairvoyance and precognition, you know, seeing the future. And we'll explore that idea more a little later. So Louise reaches out and puts her hand flat on the barrier. One of the heptapods responds by doing the same. She closes her eyes. Inspired by her, Ian approaches the barrier as well and begins to remove his own hazmat suit. 
It's worth noting that he only gets his suit partway off. I think, like the stumble on entering the new gravity, this is also foreshadowing. Louise is capable of being more vulnerable and open to this experience. Ian is more open than the rest of the team, but still keeps that protective gear halfway on, which we see reflected near the end of the film. In any case, he writes his name on the whiteboard, and Louise points to herself and Ian, then back to the heptapods, who do respond, each making their own logogram. They seem to have understood the assignment. These are their individual names. Ian volunteers that the team call them Abbott and Costello. If you aren't aware, this is the name of a very famous comedy duo from the 1940s and 50s. Costello is shorter and chubbier, while Abbott is tall and thin, reflecting the heptapod's appearance. Hands down, this duo's most famous act is their who's on first bit. The entire sketch consists of constant and repeated misunderstandings of very basic language. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Have you got a first baseman on first? Certainly. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. So those are some extremely apt and on-the-nose alien names. Louise starts breaking down their language point by point, and here we get the first flash forward since the opening sequence. A child playing in a meadow and then by a stream. Of course, on initial viewing, the audience sees this as a flashback. Louise has no idea what she's experiencing yet, and although she looks shook, she gets a hold of herself and continues working on the logograms. So, fast forward a month, and there's a couple of soldiers watching an Alex Jones-type character spew out some dangerous misinformation and violent suggestions. There's still a distinct information void for civilians and military personnel alike, even those working on the landing site, and nature abhors a vacuum. The more Louise immerses herself in the heptapod language, the more often she begins to experience flash-forwards. Just as the perception shift on first entering the ship was disorienting, so too is this perception shift. She's also tired and worn down. The lighting is again dark and the colors washed out. We see she's even having some other heptapod-related dreams and hallucinations. We learn that General Chang is mobilizing the Chinese military and Russia and other countries are following suit. Louise discovers that the Chinese team has been using Mahjong to communicate with their heptapods and explains the problem with that method. That sort of game is naturally oppositional. There are winners and losers, so the heptapod communication is being filtered through that oppositional medium. As she tells Colonel Weber, if I only gave you a hammer, then everything's a nail. The tools used in communication shape that communication. With the dire news of multiple countries mobilizing their military, time's up. She has to ask the question, even if she doesn't yet feel ready. The team enters the ship and she asks, what is the heptapod's purpose on Earth? The framing of this shot, where the answering logogram encompasses Louise's head and how she turns to Ian with a very wide-eyed expression, tells us that she can read the answer without needing a computer translation. This sort of halo visual effect is also a really interesting take on the chosen one aspect of the story. Louise is that character, the chosen one, and there is an element of sacrifice in the outcome of her story. Not that the heptapods cause her child's death, but that she must live with the awareness that it's coming, which adds a layer of sadness to every interaction they have, to her entire future. I think this shot is my favorite in the film. The message here, that knowledge of the future, and really knowledge in general, is both a gift and a sacrifice, is something I think resonates with people. This visual scene is the entire essence of this movie brilliantly boiled down to a single image. The heptapod response to the big question is, offer weapon. Louise tries to explain that they may not understand the difference between a weapon and a tool. Agent Halpern assumes that the message indicates that the heptapods are trying to get humans to fight among themselves, as if we need outside prodding for that, and unironically uses a bunch of historical human occurrences of that behavior, filtering the heptapod answer through his own perception of colonial behavior. China and Russia shut down outside communication, which causes a domino effect, and very rapidly, none of the 12 sites are talking to each other. Some of the soldiers who were listening to the misinformation earlier have secretly planted a bomb inside the heptapod ship as part of a military coup to take over the entire base camp. Louise and Ian return to the ship, hoping to clarify the word weapon, unaware of the bomb. They do get a different word out of the heptapods this time, technology, and start requesting further clarification, but time really is running out. The bomb is set to go off in a matter of moments. Louise and Ian don't know this, but Abbott and Costello do. Abbott taps the barrier with a limb, attempting to shift their attention to the danger, but fails, as he knew he must. 
Louise touches the barrier with her hand. She closes her eyes and not only experiences another flash forward, but is able, with Abbott's help, to jointly form a logogram. Costello flees backwards and releases a bunch of the writing substance as he does so. Abbott uses his last few moments to form hundreds, thousands of logograms, and then pushes Ian and Louise out of the chamber just in time to save them from the explosion, sacrificing himself in the process. China declares war on the Hyptopods, and everyone prepares for retaliation, except Louise and Ian, who continue to try and decode the last message sent by Abbott. Ian uses the term non-zero-sum game, and Louise has a flash forward where her daughter asks for a word, and that's the answer she's looking for, non-zero-sum game. Once you've seen the end of the movie, you understand that this transmission of information happens from the present to the future. But for Louise and first-time watchers, this scene is the one that really starts to hint that this isn't the past or a hallucination. Ian successfully decodes a piece of the final message using the negative space between the repeated words for time, and the answer is the fraction 1 of 12. Both Louise and Ian take this to mean that the 12 ships and the 12 human delegations are all part of a larger whole. There is also intel that the heptapods on another ship said, There is no time. Many become one. Louise and Ian see this as a request for cooperation, that all sites need to help each other put their pieces of the puzzle together, and they request reopening communication with the other sites, saying they should offer up their own data as a way to restart the communication. Agent Helpburn interprets both heptapod messages as threats and refuses. Here is where the flash forwards start to happen almost constantly. Louise has a vision of a pod descending from the main ship, and then her hands immersed in the writing substance the heptapods use. She acts on her vision. Outside, she finds the pod descending just as she saw, and she gets inside. Interestingly to me, this moment that kicks off the beginning of the film's climax and Louise's full awakening to the non-linear nature of time begins with these very dark doors closing, an image very much like an eye closing, a blind eye. Vapor fills the chamber and she turns to see the doors open, this time very reminiscent of an eye opening. There's a close-up of her blinking rapidly and this is the brightest light and color we've seen in this generally dark and washed out film. Louise's face is fully lit. I believe all of this imagery backs up the idea that this represents the closing of the physical eye in order to open the inner eye. Louise finds herself inside the chamber with Costello on the heptapod side of the barrier. Finally, the full form of the heptapods is revealed. The final barrier, the one that they had imposed, hid the majority of their bodies, and only with that final barrier removed is everything finally revealed. Costello tells her that Abbott is dying and also tells her, well, shows her really, that she already has the technology, the tool, the weapon, the gift, and it is a gift. The heptapod language opens time. Forward, backward, it's the same, just like her daughter's name, Hannah. The heptapods are giving this gift to humans because they will need humanity's help in the very distant future. It's a non-zero-sum game. Finally, Louise and the audience understand. These flashes she's been experiencing aren't hallucinations or memories of the past. They are the future. Our perspective shifts, and we reorient. Louise now has the ability to see future events and to understand what she is seeing and make use of it. Just as we can draw on information from our past, Louise can now draw on information from her future. She is returned to the base camp where she's able to start pulling information out of the future to help her in the present. She essentially learns to read Heptapod fluently from her future self, who's written a book called The Universal Language, and she finishes the translation that Ian started. She tries to get the colonel to understand, but all this wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff is a bit over his head. Her awakening to what exactly this means and what she can do continues to expand when we hear her daughter whisper, Wake up, Mommy. Which triggers a flash forward where she's at a reception speaking with General Chang. From this future interaction, she gets information that she then uses in the present and calls the general's private number and relays to him his wife's dying words. This action changes the general's mind, and he orders the Chinese military to stand down. He is now requesting to reopen communication. Denis apparently didn't want the translation on screen, as it doesn't really matter what the general's wife said, only that Louise could tell him this secret could transmit information from the future to the present. But for those of you who are curious, and hey, you're this far into the video, so I suspect you're the curious type, she said, In war there are no winners, only widows. 
Now that the threat of violence has been dissipated and lines of communication are open again, all of the heptapod ships vanish in this extremely beautiful way. They sort of just effervesce, presumably going some when else as likely as somewhere else. Again, the scene pans down from the ceiling of Louise's home, looking out this window. There's a montage of Hannah's life. Then we're jumping around in time, revealing that Ian is Hannah's father and that he couldn't handle the idea that she would die so young. He's angry with Louise when she reveals the truth to him. He says she made the wrong choice. There's a scene where he's outside and Louise taps on the glass, reminiscent of Abbott tapping on the glass, trying to warn them about the bomb. They weren't ready to understand then, now, Louise is the one pointing at the inevitable time bomb, but Ian still isn't ready to hear it. There is still a barrier between them, this time an emotional one. So we end where we began. But are there really any beginnings or endings in Arrival? Louise spends the film systematically passing through and removing barriers to communication with the heptopods. First, she passes through the barrier of space. Colonel Weber didn't want her there in person, but she insisted. This is shown when we see the helicopter through her home's glass wall. Next, she passes through the door to the ship. Then she removes her hazmat suit. And lastly, she gets into the mini pod and is taken directly inside with the heptopods, passing that last barrier. Once there, she's finally able to not only ask the initial question again, but truly grasp the nature of the answer, the gift that the heptopods have given her and all of humanity. All of the protective walls between them had to come down in order to have true understanding. All of the humans that acted out of fear also acted with a pronounced misunderstanding, a distorted view of the situation. Her ability to be open and vulnerable saved the world. Humanity now has the tool it has long needed, not faster than light travel, not fusion, a true universal language that unites us because clear communication really is the foundation of civilization. Is the final sequence a paradox? I suppose that depends on your interpretation. Classically, this type of situation where information from the future is used to change the past or present is called the bootstrap paradox, as there's no foundation holding anything up. It's a loop. But in this movie, that's a feature, not a bug. Personally, I think they sidestep the paradox quite masterfully because nothing is changed by the information from the future, only revealed. Time is a flat circle. The future already is, just as it isn't a paradox to remember something from the past because the past is fixed, it isn't a paradox to remember something from the future if the future is fixed. I think this conforms most closely to the model known as the static model of time, and specifically what's called the moving spotlight theory. In this theory, time and space are inexorably linked. An object is not there, it is then and there. If you move it, it still exists when and where it was. It also exists in all of the places that it will be. The present, that which we experience, is like a spotlight shown on a dark road. The road still exists to either side of the spotlight, but we can only see the bit in the light. The heptopod language seems to give a tiny bit of illumination to the road ahead. Louise says that Hannah is unstoppable, knowing full well she has only a handful of years to live. This isn't a kindness, or not only that. In her new understanding of time, I think that Louise understands that Hannah exists, and with little distinction between past and future, Hannah will always exist. That's why she gives her a name that's a palindrome. So when we understand this, the question isn't if Louise made the right or wrong choice. The question is, if the future is fixed, then can a choice be made or only revealed? This is a question that I can't answer for you. It's one the movie asks you to answer for yourself. But this film is not done with you yet. This isn't just a sci-fi, it's a social commentary dressed up in a heptoradially symmetrical skin. The beginning of this film is dark and washed out. Louise goes to an empty classroom, arrives to an empty house, and returns to an empty campus. Her life before meeting the heptopods, before her perceptual change, is hollow, just going through the motions without much purpose. Production designer Patrice Vermet designed the heptopod logograms to be circular, representing the way the aliens think about time cyclically instead of in a straight line. This circular symbolism is everywhere in the film, from costume details to buildings to the soundtrack. Everything is connected. 
The characters' perception of things alter how they interact with everything around them, but the reverse is also true. The world around them can also alter their perception. It's all circles, but circles with messages in them. We are living in a time when record numbers of people are experiencing loneliness, anxiety, and depression. When teenagers in high school are more likely to wake up in the morning and feel environmental anxiety than to feel wonder and excitement about their future. Our social media and news feeds are filled with fear and anger, us versus them, and impossible standards to live up to, so much so that we've adopted the term doom scrolling. Linked as we are by technology, we're somehow further from each other than ever. We're falling apart. Certain realizations about reality can lead to depression. Like Ian, we may be tempted to turn away because we fear the parts that will be painful. But Ian missed those moments after he left, all the joy and love and beauty with his daughter. More and more people are asking, if there is no God, what's the point? If the future is dismal, what's the point? If I don't really have any choices, what's the point? Nihilism is tempting sometimes. At its heart, this film is really speaking to that specific human condition and doing so in a hopeful way. We can't experience time the way the heptapods and Louise do, but all of us are on our own journey, and humans do have the ability to know bits of the future. We're all headed to the same destination, though our paths there, methods, and times of arrival vary. But on our voyage there, we will all deal with some situations that are entirely outside of our control, if we ever truly have any control at all. It's not the destination, it's the journey. And I do think that is the ultimate message of this movie. Abbott knew his journey to Earth ended in his death. Louise knows that her child will die young, that for herself, there will be grief and pain. Does Louise have a choice? Maybe, maybe not. I know what I believe, but in the end, it doesn't matter. What matters is how she faces the journey, and we know Louise embraces it. The film asks us if we can be like Louise and embrace our futures, both the difficult and the wonderful. Thank you all for joining me on this journey through perceptual shifts in communication and time. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I did making it. This is my first full movie breakdown, and I put a lot of work into it. I may have reached some conclusions you disagree with, and that's what's fantastic about art. Your interpretation is just as valid as mine. I welcome your comments and differing perspectives in the comments section. There are a lot of channels out there that find behind-the-scenes interviews, Easter eggs, or make us laugh at the films we love, and that's awesome. I subscribe to an embarrassingly large number of those channels. I am hoping to bring something that's, well, not unique, but less common with these deep analyses, looking at the meanings and messages in film and TV. If you enjoy that, then I do invite you to subscribe. I make an in-depth analysis video twice a month. Like many entertainment-based channels, I started with one IP, which if you're new here and go look, you'll see all my Good Omens theories, analysis, and videos. And I'll be honest, Good Omens is still going to be a good chunk of my content going forward, but I do intend to do more videos like this one covering other films and TV shows. If you have a piece of media you would like me to add to my list to be analyzed, please leave it in the comment section below. I'd also like to thank my patrons, those who are sticking with me while my channel evolves, and these new folks who have just now boarded the roller coaster. And all of this is only possible because of all of my viewers, you. So as always, until next time, thanks for watching.